Okay, I have 10 o'clock. Are we ready to go? Y'all ready? Haley? Judy? I'm ready. Yes. I'm ready. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the first slide then. Okay, everybody, welcome. We are excited to have you here today and to talk about food preservation. Um, okay, um, if you would please use the question and answer box down at the bottom. It should be at the bottom of your screen. It could be off to the side for any of your questions or comments. I see that the chat box is active. Um, we didn't think it would be. However, we would really appreciate having We've got some technical difficulties. Hold on just a second. What's going on, Haley? We've got black boxes, I guess we're trying to get rid of. Where, black boxes, where? I don't know, I see, I see a mouse thing flying all around the screen. Oh, that's probably mine, so I can just, is that better? Well, no, it's okay. It's just, um, are other people seeing black boxes at the, bo at the top? Yes. Yeah. I guess if you just move your mouse off to the side, because it's making a box wherever you put the, the mouse. Okay, is that better? <clears throat> yeah. Okay, okay. so um, we are putting handouts that will be available into um, the chat box with links for you to access. And then um, we're going to be discussing all four types of food preservation today. So we have with us, it's going to be two full hours. We are going to take a break partway through. And um, so then you're not just listening to one person. We have with us Haley Corbett. Haley, would you wave to everybody? Hi, everyone. Haley, Haley is um, the, the Family Consumer Science Agent in Columbia County. And we also have with us <laughs> Judy. Yeah. Is everybody seeing the black box? Yes. Okay. Um, Haley, it's something with your mouse. So um, every time you move it, we get a black box that covers the screen. Hang in there with us, everybody. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Nope. It went. Okay. So, Judy. Um, Judy Haug is a, um, and, and pronounce it correctly for me, I always say it wrong. Yes, that's correct, Haug. Okay, is a um, master food and nutrition volunteer and she is a master food preserver. So we're glad to have her. Now, we have not decided to give you everything that you need to know in two hours. That's almost impossible. And we really want you to participate in, um, hands-on classes when we open up and are able to get back together again. So if you um, would please watch for those kinds of things in your local extension office, we would love to have you. Um, so we're going to just give you really basic information today. We want to keep you safe. We see as trends start to pick up and we have um, people returning to food preservation or haven't done it and think they can, um, we hear a lot of scary things happening. And so our major purpose today is to make sure that you're doing things that are not going to cause anybody harm and that you know the basics and we'll see where you need to take it from there. Okay, Haley, there you go. Hello, this is Judy and um, <clears throat> one of the, before we uh, get going on introduction, uh, at this point here I want to uh, have everyone realize that when you start off your preserving project, particularly if you have never done it before or if you need a refresher, make sure you have the most reliable, up-to-date information. A lot of ideas and activities that were done even in the 70s and 60s are now considered old wives' tales. And um, Haley, can you move that, please? There we go. And because people used to turn jars up, turn jars upside down, and um, 
then uh, drying in the oven or dry canning in the oven or when you bring the jars out of the canner go if you're tapping on each one uh, that that also is something that we don't do very uh, much we don't do it at all because it will affect whether or not you have a seal another thing is that mayonnaise jars uh, they used to be glass and uh, there's nothing wrong with them for home canning uh, you might be able to use them once or twice but they're not very stable so things have changed and you want to make sure that you have the most reliable uh, media and where are you going to get that um, I don't want to uh, encourage you to do a lot of training from social media or blogs uh, even some family stories or recipes may not be reliable uh, for instance um, uh, uh, I do follow the blogs on canning quite a You've bit and if there are 10 people in it there would be 10 people 10 answers so um, it's social media is something that you don't want to get involved in as far as learning and particularly YouTube uh, I have seen on YouTube where, where they say uh, use noodles thickening uh, all kinds and you know here again still turning the jars upside down so um, please don't uh, try to learn from uh, YouTube one of the big things on safety nowadays and has been is botulism one gram of botulism can kill a million can kill a million people and um, you you want to make sure that you are safe in that because with botulism you cannot see it you cannot smell it you cannot taste it but it is deadly um, I encourage you to go on to cdc.gov and read what they have to say about botulism. One of, uh, there is one uh, story about a gentleman who did um, can some venison and he did everything that he uh, was supposed to halfway through the 90 minute processing for a quart of meat. He started hearing the pings and he said, huh, this everything must be uh, sealed so before the 90 minutes was up he took the jars out and um, <clears throat> of course that was then uh, that um, excuse me I'm sorry my let me uh, I know it's an annoying when one, one moment here um, so, got mail. excuse me there I'm sorry that I that I uh, that that was bothersome um, but uh, he got sick when he went to the hospital they were not able to uh, diagnose it and they thought it was a stroke so you do need to um, go by the you know the up-to-date reliable information so we can uh, go on to uh, the next topic then all right. Hi, everybody. This is Haley, and I'm going to talk to you about food safety, which uh, Judy just led into beautifully, because one of the biggest reasons we talk about food safety when it comes to canning is botulism itself. Um, and so she already gave you the basics of it. Um, the reason that, you know, it's so important and that we talk about it the most is because it's the one that can kill you and you not even realize it. So um, food safety is an important part of helping protect you against that. So food safety is important no matter in the kitchen, not in the kitchen, you know, those type of things. Um, I would say even in your garden, it's important because you have to remember that you're touching food that potentially will go in your mouth. So there are four, four food safety principles that you need to keep in mind anytime you're working with food. The first one is clean, which is your hands, um, surfaces, anything that you're consuming, you always want to make sure that you wash it. Now, your hands and surfaces, you're going to use some type of soap or disinfectant or something like that. When it comes to your foods, that's a little bit different story and depending on the food depends on the best way to clean it. The next principle is separate. 
So what that means is, is you don't want to cross contaminate. So you don't want your meats to touch your fruits, your fruits to touch your veggies, um, those type of things. You want to make sure that if you're cutting them up or you're handling them, that you make sure you wash your hands in between, use different cutting boards, knives, all those kind of things. The next part is cook and cook to proper temperatures. So I know you're probably thinking we're talking about preservation here. What does cooking have to do with anything? Well, honestly, that's essentially what you're doing when you're preserving your food. You're cooking it in some way, shape or form and making sure that it gets to that proper temperature is what's gonna make sure that it protects you from the bacteria or uh, botulism or any of the other spores or anything from being able to reproduce and cause harm to you. The last one is chill, refrigerate promptly. So in this case, you're still probably thinking, okay, how does that refer to this? Well, it depends again on how you're preserving. If you're freezing, you wanna make sure that you still follow those standards. And also, even if you're not, you don't wanna leave any type of food out for more than two hours just sitting on a counter, okay? Now, after you preserve them in your water bath or your pressure canner, of course, they have to sit so they can seal and those type of things, but that's a little bit different. We're talking about when you get this fresh produce, you're not just gonna let it sit around and just leave it there for forever. If the proper way to store it is, out like potatoes and in a dark place, that type of thing, then it's fine. But remember that if something is supposed to be cooled, it needs to be cooled no matter what. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is um, excuse me, Haley, just a second, please. We have two people that have their hands up. One person has mentioned they're having a hard time hearing. If um if the people I'm gonna unmute them just to see if that's the problem if they're not able to hear, okay? Okay. Heidi Yes. Um, you had your hand up. Was there, are you having a hard time hearing? You need to unmute. I lowered it. Sorry. That's, okay. No problem. Just That's wanted to make beauty. sure because can you hear okay? I hear perfectly. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Lisette, are you having a hard time hearing? You need to unmute if you want to have a question or a comment that you need to share. Lisette? Okay, I'm sorry, Haley. Um, if, if you're having a hard time hearing, um, please put it in the chat. It could be a connection issue. I found from my end when my um, it can get weak, um, and so sometimes it will fade in and out. Let me know if you're having a hard time, but we are recording, and we will get you a recording of it. Go ahead, Haley. Sorry. It's okay. All right, so the one thing that I wanted to make sure that I pointed out today for food safety is actually, I say one thing, there's actually two different things. So when it comes to food safety and preservation, the number one thing for anything related to food safety is hand washing. It's one of the most simplest principles and it's the one that we should follow. So here's a simple video to kind of show you the basics of everything. Hand washing is one of the most simple and effective food safety strategies you can do. Simply washing your hands before you touch food helps protect the food and you. So please make sure that you use warm water, wash your hands for 20 seconds, scrubbing vigorously, making sure you get in between your fingers, all the way around, under your fingernails, and everything. Also, when you go to rinse, you should be sure to make sure that you remove all the soap. And when you dry, you should either use a paper towel or a single use hand towel. Also, it's important that you use that same towel to turn off the knob so you don't contaminate your hands again. So that was just a simple, quick hand washing. It doesn't take very long, but it's very important that you always make sure that you do it before you touch the food. And a lot of times, even between the foods that you're using to preserve or anything like that. You also want to make sure that you wash your produce because again, that's where some of the germs can live. So here's a simple video on that. So let's talk about washing our veggies. So before we preserve any of our vegetables, we want to be sure that we wash them to get all the dirt and the bacteria off of them. With a squash like you see here, you can simply scrub with your hands because it is a smooth surface. But you want to make sure that you give it a good scrub so you remove all that dirt and all that bacteria. 
However, if you're using something like a cucumber or a potato, those are porous surfaces and those are hard, a little harder to scrub. So you're either going to want to use a scrub brush or scrub very vigorously with your hands. But you want to make sure again that you're getting all that dirt and bacteria off before you preserve it. The other part of food safety that I want to make sure that I point out when it comes to preservation is you want to make sure that the food that you're choosing to use is free of any blemishes or rot or anything like that. You really want the vegetables to be, or and fruits, to be right at their prime or just a little bit before their full ripening. If they have any bad spots or anything like that, it can not preserve correctly or increase your chances of getting that bacteria into your mix and increase your chances of getting sick from the food that you, that you do preserve. So please keep that in mind when you're choosing the fruits and vegetables in which you want to preserve. So let's, sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me, everyone. Um, I'm actually turning my phone off, or if it continues to be annoying, I'm going to put it in the other room. I'm, I'm very sorry. But the first thing is freezing that we're going to talk about. Uh, it's a very safe method of preserving your food. But of course, there uh, are always problems and there are pros and cons to it. With the pros that um, you know, it's, it's always at hand. You don't uh, use a lot of water unless you're, you're, blanching, you're blanching and um, it use, freezing uses up uh, very little uh, space. Uh, then also there are problems with the power, uh, power outages. You could go to the next one, that, that would be great. Um, there are some things that normally don't freeze very well, like cucumbers um, or celery or cabbage, because the cells will break down and they become limp and the flavors tend to change. Uh, potatoes, you know, sometimes will um, <clears throat> get grainy. Your shelf life depends upon how, of course, you uh, package and get everything ready for freezing. Uh, if you use blanching, that will stop the enzyme that uh, will deteriorate your food. But um, some of the things that you want to look at, you can either do a dry pack or you can do tray freezing. And there's a good chance that a lot of us already do the tray freezing. We may get uh, blueberries, uh, we may chop up um, onions, uh, peppers, we will lay them on a cookie sheet, put them in the freezer, and when they are uh, flash frozen, you can put them into a Ziploc and take out exactly what you need. Uh, there's also the dry pack, and there's that's where you need to put that your food into a moisture proof uh, container, you need to leave some head space. Uh, if, and that of course is for uh, expansion. Uh, in the documentation that we'll be bringing up uh, in uh, one of the books, it will give you uh, what you need to use as head space. If you use like a square container, um, a lot of times you'll use leave an inch. You don't want to pack your uh, fruit all the way to the top. And definitely the little creases in the lids, you want to make sure that's dry and uh, is not easing anything out. Um, <clears throat> now, how long is everything going to last? You know, we've all heard that three months, uh, but if everything is packaged well and prepared well, there are some items that can go from eight to 12 months. But you want to make sure that you label everything uh, so that you can rotate it. Um, how many times <clears throat> have you yourself or a family member found, you know, an apple pie at the bottom of the freezer? And um, as, as one of the movies says, well, it's got a protective ice coating on it. Uh, it's safe to use. You may not want to... Uh, eat it because it will have a lot of freezer burn and it doesn't have very good quality, but it is safe. But it's, it's just um, another reason to make sure you label everything and rotate. One of the things you might want to do <clears throat> is start an inventory sheet by your freezer and so that you, uh, 
so that you can keep track of um, everything that you do have in your freezer. Um, <clears throat> that's okay. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. And this, if it goes in bad, it's going to come out bad. Um, and here again, I've, as I've said, you label everything and it allows for a rotation. Freezer burn. If items are not packaged tightly, air can get in. And if you don't use um, a proper uh, package, some plastics uh, will, uh, will uh, crack and break. For instance, in this picture, <clears throat> the idea was good with, uh, you know, making stew as a make ahead and then leaving the right side container open for a vegetable when it came, comes time to uh, uh, reheat. However, uh, the container itself uh, does not fare very well in the freezer. And as you can see in the top there, it did crack and break open and it allowed uh, the insides to have freezer burn and as we said on freezer burn it's safe but you may not want to eat it. Um, <clears throat> freezing does not improve the flavor or the texture of your food and that's why you need to package it uh, correctly and maintain it uh, so as much as possible maintain the quality. When it comes to thawing you need to do it inside the refrigerator and not on the counter. Uh, one of the big things uh, that, um, that you might find is that if, if you want to take some soup out of the freezer for the next day, you put it on the counter, you say, well, I'm going to, uh, you know, before I go to bed, I'm going to put it in the freezer. And then we forget. The next morning, it is a little bit more than room temperature. So um, the quality and the safety has degraded then. So you want to make sure that you thaw in the refrigerator. One of the other things about freezing is that you need to worry about the power going out. And that's tough. Here in uh, Florida, if we have hurricanes and the power goes out or your appliance goes bad, that's always possible. Uh, you, you need to... Um, you need to have a, a plan and uh, you uh, should maybe find out where you can buy dry ice. Uh, a lot of times some of your larger uh, food stores will have dry ice. Maybe a hardware store has ice, uh, dry ice. Um, you would uh, want to run your freezer maybe 10 to 20 degrees below because the colder you have, the slower everything falls uh, will thaw out. But when you purchase your uh, appliance, uh, check to find out sometimes they will be able to del deliver you a, um, a loaner until you can uh, get your new, uh, until you can get your new freezer. So that is, uh, that is what I uh, have to say about uh, freezing. Uh, I myself have a, just a small freezer in the, on top of my refrigerator and uh, I always have to watch out that I don't pack everything in because uh, then you don't have, you know, a good airflow. So um, we can uh, go on to the next topic then. The one thing that I wanted to add there, Judy, is you talked about putting the soup on the counter. Um, when it comes to food safety, just remember that nothing's supposed to be at any type of room temperature for more than two hours. Um, so thawing it on the counter would definitely not be the best way. The best way would definitely be to put it in the fridge for sure. Okay, everybody. Um, we're on to dehydrating. If you have questions about freezing, we will address those after the break or, um, you know, at a, at a future session or emailing everybody. So please put your questions in regarding freezing. We're going into dehydrating now and what a shock when I got to Florida and found out people really wanted to know about dehydration because this isn't the best place to dehydrate foods. Um, we have so much humidity year round 
most part. And keeping it um, dry after it's been dehydrated can be a challenge. And um, so in Florida, we are not able to do outdoor sun drying. It's just not a safe option. Things are probably going to mold or um, really rot before they get dry. Next one, please. So I have here three pictures of um, three different dehydrators and we are not in the business of selling um, dehydrators to anybody. I'm not sure if you can see those, um, the words on my screen, it isn't looking like the words are readable. So I will read those to you so that you know what they say. On the left is a dehydrator um, that's kind of the catalyst. You know, I'm sure there's a better car out there now these days, but um, it, it's a, a very nice dehydrator made in the United States. And you see that the trays stack from low to up and there are slats for each one of those. I left it open so that you can see there's a fan in the back and there, um, the temperature can be regulated on this and you can stack trays all the way to the top. They make them um, 12 trays even make them with more. And the air blows from back to front, meaning that it's not forcing any flavors down. Now there's no way I would want to put strawberries and onions in the same dehydrator at the same time, no matter what kind of dehydrator you have. But um, in this particular case, if it's flowing from the back to the front, you're not going to get as much mixture of flavors. So maybe um, different fruits, different vegetables together. Um, I would still only do any real strong flavored herbs or vegetables one at a time. In this particular case, you might want to turn the trays around so that the front is closer to the fan um, throughout the dehydrating process, but it really works pretty well without having to do that. In the middle is a very common um, dehydrator that can be found at most of the box stores. It's a lot less expensive than the one on the far left and it has trays, I hope you can see them, that stack from the top to the bottom as well. However, the lid, which you can see on its side there, has the fan underneath. So the air is blowing from top to bottom. And when you do that, um, it, the things on top are going to dry quickest and also it's going to force the air through. So any mixtures of flavors is probably highly likely. Once again, those trays at the bottom are probably going to take a little bit longer because the air is hitting them last. And so throughout the process, you may want to change the, the order of the trays. Not um, as common as um, in some other the cheaper dehydrators. The one on the right was a super um, inexpensive, I think I got it for $12, um, but it's just a heating element and there is no fan whatsoever. So it's really best for just crafting. And um, if you are gonna try to dehydrate some food and watch the bottom, things can actually get cooked. And um, you just kind of have to rotate them frequently. If you're going to use that to dry food, you would have to do it frequently. The two on the left um, both have um, regula regulators on the top that you can adjust the temperature. The one on the far right does not have that. Next. So when we do drying, there are different ways to um, prepare the foods. In this picture you see on the far left is potatoes. They were um, blanched in salt water, so both salt and um, boiling water were the treatment. And then um, the potatoes really held their color. And if I remember correctly, it was um, a very large bag of potatoes, at least 10 pounds, went down to like two jars, maybe two and a half jars. And it's, and it's very much like the kinds of um, boxed potatoes, dehydrated potato mixes that you can find on the market. I have never done the sulfur treatment, but there are directions in the USDA guidelines for treating with sulfur if you want to do that. And then also there's a sugar treatment and dipping or um, blanching in like a sugar water to help prevent color change. And I have not done very much with that. I have done a little bit with flavor 
preferred apple slices. And um, that is helpful. In the middle um, are green beans that I believe that I just dried directly from as they were. I didn't blanch them. I didn't do any treatment other than washing them well before I put them on the trays. And the same with the mushrooms on the right. We can also make leathers out of a lot of our fruits, make them into like a sauce. And then um, we'll have a picture with some of that here in a moment. We're not talking a whole lot about drying meats. Just if it's something that you plan to do, please do follow USDA guidelines. Um, they changed their guidelines here about 10 years or so ago because they were even having problems with their recommendations and people getting ill, so please be careful. And then when you're finished with um, dehydrating, we do what we call conditioning. And these all don't, they have hot spots, they have different amounts of drying, um, depending how moist the things were when you started. And so what you really want to do is like um, put it in the refrigerator, put it into the container, put it in a ref into the refrigerator, or you can put it into the freezer. And if you have moisture coming out, if there's a lot of moisture collecting, it wasn't quite dry enough, you can put it back into the dehydrator as long as it was in the refrigerator or and, and finish drying it. But over time, if it's at room temperature, it becomes unsafe or it will mold. Next slide, please. Um, Judy made some salsa um, leather. And on the left, um, she did two different experiments. And on the one on the left is um, her first outcome. On the top is she spread out the salsa onto the tray. And um, after she was finished, um, it was kind of hard and hard to get off of the, um, the mat. On the one on the right, um, she used that, the item that came, the tray that came with it on the left. And um, so she tried it again with the tray on the right, but she lined it with parchment paper and it came out more like the leather that she would have used. Um, she says she plans to use this in some soups or things. She'll just take a piece of it and throw it into flavor things um, as she needs it. Uh, is there another slide on dehydrating? So now we're on to basic canning equipment. All right, everyone. So as you see here, there is an electric pressure cooker on the screen. And I know you're probably thinking, basic canning equipment, why am I starting here? Well, actually I'm starting here because these seem to be the newest products on the market that say that they can do canning. However, I will tell you according to um, the National uh, Canning uh, information research from Georgia uh, University, um, all of those things, they are not approved for canning even if they say they can can. They have not been approved and been proven that their temperatures can get high enough for a water bath. And that's kind of the idea for even it to begin with is simply just water bath, not the actual pressure canning. So just keep that in mind when you're buying one of these. I'm so for electric pressure cookers. And by the way, in case you wonder, the common name that people use, and I'm not endorsing a brand but it's an instant pot there are many other brands out there um, but that's the most common one that you use but they are not approved for canning in any way shape or form however they are wonderful for cooking i have one personally and i absolutely love it so there are other places that you can go um, that you can actually buy canners and that's what you want to do. You want to make sure that if you're going to do especially pressure canning that you get a canner that is approved for exactly that, not something that has multi-purpose that could go for something else. This is a prime example of, I said a pressure canner, which we'll talk about in a minute, but a water bath canner. Um, so this is something though that you don't necessarily have to have anything fancy. These are the ones that they typically sell and they can cost you a pretty penny. Um, you see here the pot and also the rack. The rack is important for many reasons. It gives you that barrier between the bottom of the pot and the sides of the pot so that the glass doesn't touch. That is something that cannot happen or it can cause issues and actually cause things to burst 
and those type of things. The other thing is, is when you put them in the water bath canner, you want to make sure that the jars themselves don't touch. So you want to make sure that you give them some space in between. You can use any stainless steel pot that you have at your house that has a lid. Um, what you want to remember is that it just has to be able to hold two inches of water over the tops of the jars that you're doing. And it's rolling boil, so it can't be just two inches and then you're praying that it doesn't boil over. You got to have a little bit of space there, but remember it doesn't necessarily have to be this kind of pot. The other thing is, is if you don't have a rack or anything like that, there are, are alternatives that you can use when water bath canning, such as a cloth on the bottom. Um, I've heard stories of dishcloths which work great, but if you don't make sure you get all the soap out of them, you could end up with a very soapy mess is what I will say. And then the other part is the rings for just the jars that you're already using, stacking them in the bottom. The goal is just a barrier and that's what you want to do. I was checking out some of the questions on the chat and I will go back to, um, we will get you the names of the different dehydrators and that information, but somebody did bring up that um, dehydrated food, it does lose a lot of nutritional value and that's true. We are going to be providing you all the pros and cons of both. Um, it's a, a little sheet that we'll be putting up in the chat for you to have access to. And that is the thing about dehydration. Um, it, it does lose a lot of the nutritional value. Um, the steam canners, so that we don't lose our, our thought here, is that steam canners had not been tested until uh, probably over 10 years ago now, but uh, about 10 years ago, the USDA um, did do some testing and said that it is equally um, effective to use a steam canner as it is to use a water bath canner, and you use the same times um, that are in the USDA guidelines. So for pints and quarts in a water bath canner, those are the amount of, amounts of time that you use in a steam canner. As you can see in this picture, this is a picture of the box of the canner that I have. So um, basically the jar goes in there in water and in the steam, when that lid is on, the steam comes up and around and makes sure that the, that water is full at the bottom because it can lose steam through the process. And once you lose steam, you have to add more water and it will impact the time. Other than that, um, as long as you have steam and keep it closed for the full amount of time, it is safe. Now I want to um, go over with you a equipment for a pressure canner. Uh, and there are two of the most uh, popular ones. And there's a picture here. This is called the All-American. And it has a dial gauge. Uh, and uh, it uh, requires uh, manual uh, testing. It's good for higher al altitudes. There's another one uh, called Presto and it will have the weighted gauge that you see uh, on the right-hand picture. It's good for the lower altitudes, and uh, if you're not one that uh, you would like to uh, watch your dial, the weighted gauge is, uh, is a very con uh, convenient type. Um, one of the things that you will want to uh, watch also is that in your, uh, in your canner, uh, you want to make sure, and it's already been said that your jars are not touching because the water does uh, jiggle a little bit and you don't want your jars touching and exploding. Also in your uh, lid uh, with the, the Presto, you will have a rubber gasket. And uh, this will give you a good seal with uh, your canner. The American uh, canner does not have a gasket. It is metal on metal. Uh, with the gasket, uh, you want to make sure that it's pliable. After so many uses or years, it can develop little cracks. What, um, and every year as you begin, you want to take a look at your equipment to make sure that it is proper. Uh, there will be a steam vent that uh, where the steam will come up. You'll literally want to hold it up to see if you can see through that. If you have a teeny, teeny, tiny brush, 
maybe run it through uh, the rubber gasket when you begin. You can put like two drops of vegetable oil on your finger or a paper towel and go round and round and round on the gasket to make sure that it is uh, pliable. Uh, when you do go ahead to purchase a canner, and it is a, an investment, um, they are not as inexpensive as a water bath canner, and there all are no alternatives. You do need to have um, a, uh, a canner that has uh, some way to detect pressure and temperature. It's the temperature that will kill the bot botulism, not necessarily uh, the pressure. And you can only get that high temperature when it's sealed and um, the water will go up to 240 degrees. Inside the canners, you have to have a removable rack so that the jars are not sitting on the bottom. If you have a canner that is deep enough that you want to have two levels, then you'll just have to, oh, I guess you have to bite the bullet and uh, buy an extra rack. You do need to have a rack between uh, the levels if you decide to go with two, um, two levels. Um, another thing that I can bring up, and that is sometimes if you only want to do single serves, on uh, your pressure canning or your vegetables. Um, a, your uh, manufacturer will tell you several things. My manufacturer tells me they want three quarts in the water. Uh, some manufacturers may say two inches. Well, if you were, you do not want the water to go over the top of your jars. And if you're using a small, um, I call them jelly jars, eight, eight ounces um, or half a, half a pint, the water may go over it. I and uh, what I have seen some people do it, are put the um, uh, the rings, the canning rings, on the bottom, and then put the rack on top. It will raise your your jars up a little bit. If the water goes over your your jars, all of a sudden now you have water bath canning. So that that's uh, just a couple things. Uh, and I'm not sure if I said when you go to uh, purchase a, a canner, you need to have one that's large enough that will hold four jars. Um, let's see here. Also, I think I went through the, the steam pipe where the, the steam will come out when you vent it. Also, there is what's called the automatic vent. Uh, and that is uh, normally on the, the side and when the pressure and the temperature raises appropriately, it will come up and it will lock the canner and you will not be able to open the canner at all. Um, and it is also a good test that if you do have a dial and you have one of these automatic um, uh, vents uh, and if the dial says zero pressure, you say, ah, I'm going to open it. No, not until this automatic vent goes back down into the lid. That is, uh, there is still pressure in there if, if not. Um, also, one, uh, one last thing, and that is if you let your steam or your pressure get too high uh, and you run out of water, you will warp the bottom of your canner and no longer is it any good. And um, let's see here, I think I have brought everything up that I, I need to have. So uh, if you can go ahead and start talking about jars. Okay, um, we have several pictures here. There are so many different kinds of jars on the market. Um, we recommend using mason jars. Um, Jardin Brands has purchased um, both the Ball and the Kerr company and so they're making all of the jars right now. If you have old jars, you can use them. The thing is, is that with time, they can still crack and break. I've had phone calls from people who have had jars for 20 to 30 years, and those jars, they have a problem with sealing, or they have something that breaks every time. We have to remember that nothing lasts forever, um, but if you have access to some used jars, um, you know, you can give them a try. You to try putting them in boiling water and see if anything happens. Look them over carefully. 
Um, Heidi's on our call right now and she showed us a picture the other day of um, a, a jar that was like melted. It, just, it was misformed after it came out of the canner. And one of the things is, is you have to check these closely, look for cracks and make sure that you use the right equipment and take really good care of the jars. Now Luann, Luann, this is Heidi. The yeah. jar was not misformed coming out of the canner. That's why you're telling people to look at their jars because the lady, you know, she kept, you know, she kept arguing with me that it happened when she was canning. It takes oh, it about 1,200 degrees to melt glass. Apparently, the, um, the Newell, they're all, they've been bought out again by, their garden's been bought out by Newell, apparently. But they said that um, that should have been inspected and pulled off the, the line, the assembly line, but somehow it got through. But it was a bubble, like in the processing. Okay, thank you for correcting me on that. So, but watch, because especially older jars, if they have a seam in them, they are very old. And um, watch for those bubbles as well. If that's and may, may I jar. also say, I have had some experiences um, with people um, when they more than finger tight their jar. Yeah, and we're getting to it, that, okay? Okay, thank you. All right, they, yeah, thanks. Sure. All right. Um, so the jars can be reused, obviously. Those rings can be reused. However, especially in Florida, they rust very easily. So um, we'll be telling you that you take them off of the jar. You don't store your jars with that ring on them. So make sure they're cleaned and really dried. And just like your dehydrated items, get it into an airtight container to try to keep them from rusting. And um, the lids are not reusable. The ones shown um, out of the box, they can only be used once. Now people try using them again and again, and sometimes you might get a seal, but after you go through all that work, it's not worth it if half or more do not seal the second time. So that is the reason why we do not reuse those lids. They're nice to store on empty jars, jars clean during storage, but you don't want to get them mixed up with the, the new lids that you'll be using later. The Tattler lids um, are BB, PBA free and they say that they are reusable. Um, they have done very little testing, but the USDA has said that the testing they've done has shown that they're not as reliable to get a seal. And so, um, we, we just don't recommend them at this point. Okay, let's talk about the gadgets. We've already discussed, you know, um, the, re the investment of a, a canner or uh, a pot that you might have that you can reuse. Uh, we've talked about what uh, you need for pressure canning. Now let's talk about some of the other gadgets. Um, if you've never done canning before, you will want to go ahead and get this canning set, it's called. If, um, if you have an online vendor that you like, you can just, uh, you know, search for canning equipment and I, I swear you, you'll get all kinds of uh, kits. But um, in one, you have a jar lifter. Uh, you cannot lift the jars out of the, a canner, either pressure or water bath, with the tongs. It, it's just not safe. Plus, you can also burn yourself. Then there's the funnel. Uh, then there's the tongs if you need, and then the jar tightening. I'm not sure why they put that in, because you really shouldn't uh, tight the, tighten the jars as much as that uh, I'm going to call it a, a jar pliers, as much as that looks like it might encourage. The next piece of equipment is, uh, it serves two things. First, on headspace, that is the amount of space that you need to, um, uh, to leave at the top of the jar so that you can get a good seal. And it, there are some that's um, an inch, a half inch, uh, an eighth of an inch. This will um, measure that for you. Then the other end that you can use is you very carefully, and because it's plastic, you won't, you won't um, scratch your jar, but you can go around the inside of the jar and it will 
take care of any air bubbles that you might have. And of course, the air bubbles in it uh, can promote botulism or mold. The last piece is it is uh, everyone will want to have it and say, glory be on this one. Uh, if you go to put your lids on your jars and they're sitting in warm water, uh, you may not want to stick your fingers in there. This stick has a magnet on the bottom of it and it allows you to take the, the, out of, take the lid out of the warm water and lets you position it on top of your jar. And that's whether you're pressure canning or water bath canning. So those are the, the basic uh, gadgets. If you can help me with the, the next slide, I'll show you some of the optional um, gadgets that you might want to have. Uh, I have a pair of rubber gloves. If you decide to do, you know, some high level salsas or working with peppers um, or pepper jelly or any kind of peppers, you, it's, it's good to have a, a set of good gloves. You can burn your hands uh, enough that it will keep you awake at night. Um, there's also a, what I call an upgraded jar lift. Um, it's, it's pricey. I, I uh, looked online the other day and it's $20. And I said, I don't believe that I spent that much, but I must have. Um, this, I, and the reason I got this is because I had canned so much that the plastic on the handles of the kit uh, came off. So this is easy. It takes, um, takes a little bit of uh, coordination to get used to it. The next item is, can be called a spider. But if, if you were to get nothing else, I would say get that, um, that tool right there in the middle. It helps you take potatoes out of hot water, beans out of hot water, anything that you need to transfer out of, um, out of water, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a great strainer. Uh, and uh, the alternative name for it is spider. The next three things are different utensils. Uh, if you don't have the plastic, uh, pla plastic piece that you can uh, work around the inside of your jar, you can use a spatula or go ahead and use a chopstick. The, the last piece is a remote, uh, remote uh, thermometer. And uh, I normally sanitize all my jars, no matter what they say. And to sanitize, you need to take your jars to 280 degrees for 10 minutes. Um, I don't know how to eyeball that. And so that helps me a lot. Plus then to, uh, to water bath, you need to go to 212 degrees. And so that just allows you a more precise measurement. So those are some of the gadgets that uh, you do need to uh, start your canning and they would just make your experience a whole lot easier. Okay, Luann. Okay, everybody, um, let us know if you've had some difficulty. Um, I think Kaylee is bringing up a poll, if you will take a poll. And after you take the poll, go ahead and take a break. But in the meantime, we will look over your questions. We will try to answer some of them now or at the end of the whole session. So um, please take a break until um, 11 o'clock and make sure you get up and move and stretch because we've had you sitting for a while. Anyone miss the poll? I'm about to close it. Looks like we got a few more people. If you want to join in, we'd appreciate it.
somebody ask how many questions there are on the poll? Is it's just one question? Yeah, it's just one. I'm going to stop sharing um, and try to see if I reshare if it helps with the mouse issue and also um, try to see if I can put some of those links in the chat box for people. If not, um, we will provide the links via your email with everything in one simple sheet for you to get to after the webinar is over. Okay, those, um, this is really just for Judy and Haley. Um, as we go through the questions, um, we'll have to just probably answer most of them at the end. But a couple of these things will be coming up during the process too. Um, somebody also said something about having um, their sound locking up every 20 seconds. Is that on their connection, do you think? Yeah, that's probably. To run Zoom, it takes a um, lot of bandwidth. And so sometimes they can make it difficult. Also, if they're trying to run their video, um, it may be if they just shut their video off or anything like that, anything extra that they have that could be taken the bandwidth can make a difference too. And I got a big yellow box that said there was sound interference. And so that's how I lost Heidi in that process. I didn't, I don't know what I did. The yellow box is gone, but um, I'm the only one that's not muted right now, I think. Luann, if you have your file, you can click add to the Dropbox or to the tap box. That would be great. For some reason, um, it's not letting me do the same. I'm not sure. What do I need to do to, what are you asking me to do? 
if you have the file for the pros and the cons that they were asking for, if you want to just um, save it and then put it as like a PDF into the Dropbox, they can get to it or the chat box, sorry, Dropbox, chat box. Um, if not, I'll send it to them afterwards. Okay, what is the thing they're asking for? Didn't you, the pros and cons, didn't you tell them? Oh, the pros and cons, yes. Oh, I might have found it. Hold on. I might have found it. See if my computer will allow me. Well, I'm hoping everybody's back. Um, yep. It's 11 well, o'clock. So. I'm going to put, see if I can, I'll have to send it to them via email, but I did find it. And I'm going to share my screen again. Let me know if there are any issues. And if there are, then we'll swap and you can do it. Okay. And... Still All right. Sorry, now it's not wanting to show it all, which is dandy on Zoom, which is weird. All right, let me try exit and start again. There it goes. All right. Welcome back, everyone. I hope that you got a good move and a stretch in. Um, if you know anything about most of us that are on this call, we're all family consumer science agents, which means we all talk about food preservation and food safety and lots of things related to food. But we're also very much about promoting physical activity part of things. So the longer you sit, the worse off it is on your health most of the time. So please make sure that even if you didn't get up, stand up now and just move around a little bit um, so we get all the blood flowing and everything back to you. So this time we're going to start talking about um, actual food preservation before we were kind of just talking about the basics, the things that you need, all those kind of things. Now we're going to dive into a very basic level of kind of what you do in order to preserve those types of foods, which ones can be done which way, all those kind of things, resources that you can use, rules, um, all of those kind of things, the basic principles. So please join us. And again, if you have any questions or anything, let us know. And I apologize for the, the black box that evidently I was creating. Um, and if I create it again, I apologize too. I have absolutely no idea. I do not see it on my end. Um, so I really apologize for that. But let's start off with a bang on the canning basics. So we already talked about water bath canning and pressure canning and freezing and dehydrating. So now we're just going to focus on the actual canning. So either water bath canning versus pressure canning. And you think, okay, so why does it matter? Why do we care whether we water bath or pressure can? Well, we can go back to the beginning and talk about the food safety and botulism and um, all the other bacteria that can grow and infect the food that you're eating without you even knowing. So there's an importance to which method to use and why. And that really is based on your pH scale, which all of you probably remember at some point in school, we all learned about pH, we all learned acidity and alkalinity and all those kind of things. And half of us probably forgot it or we have to rethink about which ones. So acidic is anything um, below seven, and then alkalinity is anything above. So really and truly all our foods are some form of acidic, but there's different level, levels of um, acidity. So you have to pay attention to which ones are in which levels because that determines not only the way you can it, but also if you need to add anything to it. So we're gonna start at the top. We're gonna start at lower acids which you should see as a three or four on the scale. And these is gonna be for water bath canning. So anything above that line in the center above the line in the center is gonna be your high acids and that's gonna be okay to do in water bath. This lists a bunch of different things, but the general idea is water bath canning is for fruits, pickles, and soft spreads. 
Now, if you notice, there's a big clump of ones up at the top around the, between the three and the four, and then the pears kind of comes down a little, and then the tomatoes and the figs is even further closer to that center line. The reason the pears, tomatoes, and figs are a little closer is they actually need a little bit more acid added to them in order for them to safely be able to be water bath canned. So that's just something that you have to keep in mind. Now, this is something that they've done lots of studies on to be able to figure this out. So it's not something that, you know, your grandma way back in the 50s may have not added acid to our tomatoes. But I can tell you from working with ag agents as well that our tomatoes have greatly evolved over time. And there's many reasons that we make these suggestions and tell you that these are the ways that you need to do to protect yourself. Now let's get to the under that line. So we're still in that acid level, remember, but we're now higher. So you have your meats, your veggies, your seafood, your poultry, and they're all kind of in this area. And as you see, they're spread out here. These are the ones that you need to pressure can. You need to not only get that temperature, but also that pressure up there so that you hold that temperature for that long time to kill and get rid of all that bacteria to protect you in the long run. So the reason that we have to pressure can is we need that higher temperature and that pressure is what gives it to us and helps us to keep it maintained. So just remember, you can't just decide, oh, anything I wanna do, oh, as long as I get it hot enough, I can water bath. Or, oh, I can do anything in the pressure canner. It depends on what it is because it can also message, mess with the product that comes out, okay? You want to make sure that what you're getting out, as we talked about with dehydrating, freezing, canning, everything, is something good of quality because if not, what's the purpose and why would you even want to eat it? The next part that I want to tell you about when it comes to this is we talk about that pH scale, but also having the knowledge to be able to know that those things fall on that VHCL, but to know what you need to use to make sure that you're using the right amount, what goes in it, how much headspace, all of those things when you're actually canning. Whether it's water bath canning or pressure canning, you need to make sure that you use USDA research for your safety, okay? The University of Georgia has a lab that is completely and utterly devoted to just canning, okay? That's all that they do there. They can and make measure the temperature to make sure this comes out, make sure they don't take any bacteria, all of those things. So you want to make sure that you're using the resources that are available to you that are up to date and that have research behind them. So as you see on the screen, this is so easy to preserve a book. And actually, I'll tell you, I have mine right here in front of me. I have it and use it anytime I'm doing. And I'll tell you that I would probably say Miss Judy and even Miss Lynn, they may have canned for millions of years and have done the same recipe 15 different times. But I guarantee you that before they do it, they still go pull out this book and just kind of look over it real quick again to kind of get an idea. The other way that you can do it, this book is for purchase. You can also get the USDA, USDA canning principles. Sorry, my tongue got tied. Um, and those are available online. You can also order a book of it and have it shipped to you, but I put that link in the chat box that you can go to and each one of them are listed there. It's just a smaller version of the So Easy to Preserve and it doesn't have quite as many of the recipes. It's still based on the same information. And then of course, if you're completely digital, the best place to go is the National Center for Home Food Preservation. They have everything that you need there and they can make sure that they give you the proper information to make sure that you're being safe. I know that another discussion that, you know, I hear a lot, even as I talk to people about canning, is ball. Ball has always been the big name that's out there and that everybody, um, you know, makes ball. They use ball this or they use ball that. Actually, me, Judy, and Leanne just had a talk about Judy's, I think she said she's, or maybe it was Leanne said they still have a, can, a ball canning book from the 50s, okay? And I'm not saying that that's not cool because that's a really cool idea. But what you have to remember is that that canning book is not going to have the most up-to-date research research and it's not going to have the most up-to-date uh, ways to can and you are putting yourself at risk if you're not using the most up-to-date resources available to you. So just remember those type of things. We also do not uh, endorse ball ourselves at the university and the reason behind that is not because we think they're a terrible company or anything like that. We don't promote companies anyways but with ball you have to remember that they are a private institution and they do their own research. We do research that's provided through universities and in this case it's the University of Georgia. So if you have any questions always make sure that you go to the National Center for Home Food Preservation not to that crazy YouTube channel as Judy mentioned earlier. Okay, uh, we're going to get more into canning and uh, preparing.
Now this will go, the headspace will go for whether it's water bath or for uh, pressure canning. You need a certain amount of what's called headspace so that you can get a um, two things. You get a good vacuum and so that you have a seal, but also it allows for not any uh, siphoning. And I'll go over that in just a little bit. But there are about three different kinds of, of um, headspace. Uh, a lot of times your quarter inch or even your eighth of an inch, uh, your jellies and jams, and that's where you have the, um, uh, the plastic uh, measuring stick. Uh, then for sauces and pickling, you would probably want a half an inch. And, but for vegetables and meats, you do need to have that one, that one inch. If you um, have more than that, or if you bring your jars out and uh, the water has siphoned out, you may not have such a, a good seal. But the one inch allows for enough processing time to get a um, good space. If you have too much headspace, um, you might end up with your uh, food above a water line or a brine line and you may not get a good seal. Uh, and I think I'm probably repeating myself here because you didn't have enough processing time to get all the air out of the jar. And if you don't, um, also you can, pr what might happen if the jars or if the liquid seeps out around the lid, okay, your seal is jeopardized or you might begin mold around the lid. And it may, one thing I found uh, with the jar of pickles this week, and that is um, I had a jar of pickles for about a year. I was going to pick it up. I said, boy, this is wet. What's going on? And the jar was sealed, but all of a sudden I was able to take that lid and twist it off. And underneath the lid was mold. It had just, you know, the liquid had seeped out. Um, and things like that can happen over time. So that's why you do need enough headspace. Um, I, I really thought I had enough headspace, but sometimes just over a matter of, of uh, months or whatever, your, um, the seal can uh, uh, degrade. Um, I uh, sometimes get a little OCD and about every three months I take a look at my jars and I'll just tap to make sure that they're all sealed or I do take a good look at them. I'm always surprised when I don't have uh, a seal on one of my jars. But then um, I have a small home, so I don't have a, uh, all the storage that many of you will have. So uh, for me to take a look at all my jars every three or four months is, is no big deal. So that is um, headspace. Now another term that you want to um, uh, look at, and that is venting jars. So now in your pressure canner, you have your jars in, you have turned your, the lid on your canner and you've sealed it. Uh, everything looks good. You're starting out uh, with um, the pressure and the temperature that you need, but you cannot start timing the processing time until you've vented your jars. And what you're doing is you're making sure all of the air gets out of your uh, machine. One moment, please. <coughs> mm. Now, can you see that? When, sometimes, and I know I have uh, trouble, when I, um, my canner is on the counter and um, I know when I have canned with Luann, I'm not sure if it's the backdrop or whatever, but we can surely see the steam start to rise out of that vent pipe. Me, I, I don't know, it's mine's in front of a window and I can't. But if I go like that over the, if I think it's venting and the steam is coming out and I go like that real quick, not to burn myself, but to feel the steam, and then I will time for 10 minutes just to make sure that you get all the excess air bubbles. If you don't do that, you may not 
be able to get the temperature that you need to kill all the microorganisms in them. Well, Judy, can I interrupt just a second, Judy? Oh, well, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's that's pressure canning, and we're aren't we on water bath or just basic? I'm on. I'm on yeah. venting. When we get into pressure canning, we'll do that. It's just the jars really all need to be vented in general canning, whether it be either kind. I, d I just want to verify for people. Okay. Okay. That's fine. I, I guess I've never, I've never called, uh, I see what you're saying there with the, the spatula. This sort of the same process, you're getting all the extra air out of the, the jars um, so that you can get a good seal and also um, and uh, any extra air in there may promote mold. So, uh, Luann, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I guess I've never called that venting on water bath. Sorry. Okay, um, the basic, some of the basic rules on do not, of course, don't let your jars touch each other uh, because when you're uh, canning, some of the water will start to jiggle. You don't want them to touch. Uh, they should not, jars should not touch the bottom of the pot. Um, and don't pack the jars too tight with product. Otherwise, you can't get a good Air, uh, you can't get a good processing temperature through it. That is uh, why we really don't uh, are, are not supposed to uh, can uh, squash or pumpkin pureed because it's too dense. Uh, and do not lighten the rings, uh, tighten them too tight or too loose. Uh, too loose and uh, you don't get a seal, too tight and uh, your rings might buckle, and here again, then you don't get uh, you you don't get a good seal. Uh, after the jars, uh, after you've done processing, uh, and you remove the jars from the canner, and when you're removing them, you're not tilting them; you're taking them straight up. Don't tighten the rings again. Don't push down on the lid. Um, they should, you should put them onto a towel or a rack that is stable and let your jars um, set and cool overnight or at least 12 hours. And then you can go ahead and uh, touch to see if you have a, um, a seal. If you don't have a seal, then you'll want to put them into the refrigerator. There are processes where you can uh, recan them, but uh, you'll want to go ahead and check the sources that uh, Haley brought up on how to go ahead and recan anything, and you need to do that within 24 hours if you decide. So that's um, all we have for uh, the uh, do's and don'ts. Okay. Um, Yes, I, I guess I'm on water bath, right? This is um, a water bath canner that she's already discussed with you. And I think that um, we've kind of covered those things. We're gonna be talking about some steps in water bath canning. But what's fun about water bath is all the different things that you can do. And um, here's some things that you actually made from left to right. We have canned uh, pineapple. Um, she did some pickled beets. Uh, pickles, peaches, um, she did salsa, and also um, she did some pickled corn or corn relish. Now that's the thing to really pay attention here is those vegetables have to have a lot of acid added and that's why we want you to follow USDA tested recipes. When you um, make up your own recipe, if you don't have enough acid in there or a nice um, balance, then you are going to have issues. It would be the required to be pressure canned. And then somebody's gonna call me with a recipe and say, well, tell me how to pressure can it and make sure it's okay. And we're not able to give this out. Um, so we do have a lot of recipes available in those two references that we gave you and we highly recommend that you follow them. But you can do fruits, you can do jams and jellies on the next slide. Um, I guess, my jams and jellies might be later. So we will just go into the steps of water bath canning. So we're gonna use an approved recipe and it has to be into a hot and sterile jar. 
in a pressure canner, you don't have to have sterile jars, but one at a time, that jar needs to come either out of your sanitizing dishwasher, which is still running. Um, it can't be cooling down from a sterilized position. It needs to be super hot and sterile, and you do them one at a time out of that or out of uh, a pot of boiling water that you've put the jar into. And then um, just to clarify this venting the jar, we, um, I understand the confusion here. For some reason, we vent the canner, but we also vent the jar. Basically, that's releasing air. And um, maybe USDA could come up with another term for venting the jar for us. But basically, using that spatula or, you know, there's that little device and all those extra gadgets, you slide it down and you can see the air bubbles come out. So that extra air is not going to come to the top and hopefully um, then you don't have a problem with releasing a seal once it's been made. After the product is in there, you've vented the jar, then you wipe the rim. Any product that is in between that lid and the rim can mold or spoil and then contaminate your jar. So you don't want anything between that rubber um, rim and um, the rim of your jar. You want those to be able to create a good seal. And then you tighten the ring, and that's what Heidi was talking about. You don't want to tighten it too tight, and you don't want it to be too loose. There are gadgets on the market that you can use to make sure it's exactly right. And I have seen um, men in classes, I'm not trying to be biased, but I have seen men in classes tighten it so tight that what happens then, it breaks that rubber seal, and then you just have the metal lid against the glass and then you don't get a good seal. Then if it's not on there tight enough, it's not gonna create a good bond. So basically you just make it good and snug, but not too tight. And um, we used to test the, the torque. That was what we called it. We had to be real careful with that. Just make sure it's good and snug. Or you can, if you're concerned or have a problem with jars sealing, there is a gadget on the market that will just get it just right for you if you wanna use that. And now the jar is ready for in the canner. Basically, you use your jar lifter, put it down into the boiling water, and then process after it returns to a boil. And it has to be a rolling boil two inches over the jars. You put the lid on top, and then you start to process as long as it's back to that rolling boil. Usually when you put the jars in, it'll slow down a little bit. After the time is processed, you can go ahead and take the jars out. Um, typically, you're supposed to turn it off um, and then let it sit 10, 5 to 10 minutes and then take out the jars. I'm sorry about that, Haley. You did fine. You can go ahead and go to the next one. So in um, tomato products, um, sorry if it's blurry for you. I know it's kind of <laughs> Okay, um, I don't know where that interference is coming from. It's not here, but um, hopefully we'll be okay. Um, in doing water bath canning with tomatoes especially, there is no um, set amount of acid in those tomatoes. And there are some tomatoes that are low in acid. So just to verify that we have it acidic enough, it is recommended to add bottled lemon juice. And I know some people don't wanna use that. They'd rather squeeze their own lemons but um, we want consistency in the acid level, which just like in the tomatoes, we might not get consistency in the acid level of the, of the lemon juice that's added. Um, you can also use ascorbic acid. You can buy it in um, a pharmacy. You can sometimes buy it straight at the um, canning supplies, but ascorbic acid could be added, lemon juice or vinegar. And the vinegar is also going to maintain uh, a 5% acidic level. Not all lemon juice that's bottled is at that level that it's anywhere from 4.5 to 5 is what we understand. So <clears throat> FDA requires it to be at least 4.5. And that needs to be added. Think about how it might influence the flavor of the product. And then I also put this up here, if, it, if we don't mention it ever again, just I don't know how many times we need to remind people because I still have to remind myself to do it. I have those tomato products sitting there and just by looking, there are two different things there. I'm pretty sure the left is like a pizza sauce type product and the one on the right I think is salsa. But if you haven't labeled it, 
you don't know for sure. So make sure you label everything really well. On the right, follow the recipes very closely. Sugar in our jams and jellies is uh, is part of the preserve is part of what makes things safe, and so if you're using a pectin um, that is not or for sugar or sugar free, um, those recipes typically are not sugar free without any sugar, but it's a lot lower sugar. But you buy the pectin and you follow the recipe that it's given you. In the middle, you can make your own fruit honeys, and those recipes are available through um, putting the the book. And I know there was a fee to that, but So Easy to Preserve does have a variety of honey recipes in there. It's very thick, so make sure that you follow the guidelines. That middle jar is a small jar. It's a, what is that, an eighth of a pint, um, half pint, a quarter pint jar. And so basically there are not separate directions in the USDA guidelines for those sized jars. What you're going to want to do is follow the ones for the half pints. Um, they recommend that you follow those timings in the water bath. And if you add ingredients like you do in the conserve, a conserve, it means it has additional ingredients added. So in the one that's pictured there is a pear conserve recipe that's in, in the book and it has added nuts but also has some citrus added to it to help probably with that acid level related to the pecans that are in it. But um, be careful that you don't add any more than what it suggests. You may say, oh, I really like the pecans in there, so I'm going to add extra. It could change the pH. So make sure you follow recipes very, very carefully. Those recipes with the tomatoes, when you add extra vegetables to it, oh, I like a lot of peppers in there. Well, you may change the pH, and it's very, very important that you not change the pH and make it dangerous. And also when we're looking, I already mentioned about the um, pectin. Some recipes do not require pectin because the type of fruit has a natural pectin in it. Um, the sugar is the preservative that I already mentioned, so follow those recipes. Uh, people don't want so much sugar, I understand that, but that's what makes it safe in this case. So um, making sure that you clean the rim of the jar really well, because once again, that's gonna get sticky and that's when you're gonna have a problem. A lot of times you're not gonna get things like botulism from your jams and jellies. What's gonna happen is they're gonna ferment, they're gonna get moldy, or you're gonna get yeast growing on them. And um, either way, it's soured and you need to throw them out. We don't recommend that you eat them. And then um, there's a picture there of removing the foam from the top before you put it in. You do not want to have that in your jar when you preserve it. It gets rubbery and sticky and it's not very pleasant to eat really. Okay. Judy. Okay. Now we're back to uh, pressure canning basics. Um, a lot of people will fear pressure canning because they've heard, uh, you know, in past uh, years of where the lids have just blown up and uh, being very dangerous. And this may have been in some of the older uh, canners, but some of the, all of the newer ones have, and you can see the dark spot in that uh, picture there. And that is a uh, rubber plug. And if by chance you let too much pressure build up in your canner, the only thing that will blow is that rubber plug. And if that be the case, then of course you will have to, um, you know, shut your process down and um, <clears throat> you will uh, have to uh, go, it, you will uh, go through the procedure that's in the book. But, um, it jar lids, or excuse me, pressure canner lids do not explode anymore. Uh, when it comes to pressure here in Florida, uh, we usually use 10 pounds of uh, pressure and that's because of the altitude. If you were to move out to Colorado, you'd have to refer uh, to your documentation because things uh, uh, change. And fruits uh, can be uh, 
uh, canned at a lower pressure because they are uh, not as uh, acidic uh, as um, as uh, as uh, as pickling. Um, <clears throat> the you can how uh, excuse me here we get to venting the canner and uh, the first thing once you have your jars in and your um, and your lid tightened up you start your canner you start the heat and after the can or excuse me when the canner starts to vent that is the steam starts to come out uh, what you want to do before you put a rocker on or before you uh, start to bring it up to pressure, you want to, to bring it up to wait for 10 minutes. Now, this is where um, uh, I have said don't watch things on YouTube. Uh, I was watching one the other day. It was a, a canning 101, and uh, the person said to only vent it for five minutes. Well, uh, the USDA has strictly said you must vent it for 10 minutes to make sure that you do get all of uh, the air out of it. Uh, for hot packed uh, foods, uh, before you bring your uh, jars, put your jars in, you want to bring the water up to 180. And that's where I use my remote uh, temperature. I've seen some people use the candy thermometers, and if that works, that's great too. Um, if you're going to just uh, do the uh, raw packed, you only have to bring the water and the jars up to 140. Because you are going to be at such high temperature and pressure, you normally do not have to sanitize your jars. If you want to go ahead and do it, certainly you can go ahead and do that. Sometimes um, when you, uh, you, you have something cold, you have to watch out, uh, such as chicken breasts, when you uh, put those in, or cold, uh, cold, cold uh, vegetables. Uh, you don't want to temperature shock your, your jars. So that's why you're only going to bring the jars up to 140. And, uh, then uh, your jars will less likely uh, explode in the in the in the canner. Uh, if your jars do explode in the canner, and sometimes they will, it may you may be canning beans. And if you don't uh, hydrate your beans overnight or hydrate them according to the instructions, they will expand and uh, your jars will explode. Also, if your jars are too tight, then uh, likely you can have something explode or your jars are going to warp. Sometimes if you have old, old jars or inappropriate jars, you may get uh, jars that explode in uh, your canner. Um, now we get to siphoning, and that is, um, that's where the liquid comes out and you don't uh, quite know what happens. And that could be that you have a sudden change in pressure. Um, if you are going to use the dial, the, the dial uh, gauge, uh, and you see that it's getting too high and you all of a sudden turn it down or you all of a sudden turn it up or down, those sudden changes can cause siphoning. That's where the water will come out. Um, if you do not allow your jars to cool off, uh, you can get uh, siphoning. I remember the first time I did that, uh, I, after the processing time, I shut everything off, I let the pressure go down, I opened the, the canner lid, I let it set for 10 minutes, and then took the canner lid off and started taking the jars out. And the first jar that came out fizzed like I was opening up a can of soda. And I should have let it um, cool down more naturally. It lets everything, uh, you know, any, anything that's boiling inside, it allows the temperature to come down and it uh, helps with the sealing. Um, it, here again, if you have uh, very little, if you haven't uh, enough uh, headroom, uh, of course, you're going to get some siphoning. Um, and if you didn't get all the air bubbles out, you're going to get siphoning. If you put too much juice in it, 
um, you may end up uh, having a bad product. So I only bring that up because I've seen a lot of people ask about siphoning. Should I use this or should I not? Um, if you have, if as long as when the jars come out and if there is siphoning and um, you have not lost that much, if it, it goes a little bit below your product, you're probably going to be okay if you've processed everything correctly and if you have um, a, a good seal, you um, will, it, it will be okay. Some, some people uh, don't have siphoning and that is very good, uh, but sometimes in a canner pro project, you do get a lot of uh, siphoning. Definitely, if your uh, liquid siphons down to half of the jar, um, you, do not have a good project and uh, you'll maybe want to put those in the refrigerator or if they're sealed you may want to use those right away. Uh, once as far as how long um, how long should you uh, pressure can. Uh, there's uh, a lot of times uh, for uh, there'll be 60 it'll say 60 or 75 or 90 whatever the recipe says, whatever the book, you're going to be following the recipe from, uh, from the so easy to preserve or the uh, USDA and it will tell you precisely if when you decide to do a canning process project and you cannot find the vegetable with uh, instructions, then it's never been tested, such as cabbage. Cabbage has never been tested. Cabbage can be water bath and pickled, but cabbage cannot. Um, and I don't know that there's a scientific reason other than it's not been tested. Uh, so those are some of the, the basics. When you uh, bring your jars out, you put them on a towel, let them cool down, and then of course you're going to want to uh, take the screw lid off, you're going to want to wipe it down, and that's when you'll be able to tell if you have any minute problems with the seal because the lid will just come off even though it looks like it's sealed. Um, if you put a little vinegar in your canner, um, that will help some of the, uh, keep the scum off of your, uh, your jars. Uh, Luann, that's, uh, I think we're ready for you. Okay, As somebody had asked this earlier, and so um, I hope they're still on. I know that we kind of made it into two separate classes. So um, glass stove tops, they have made some new um, pots that are made for um, glass. I would like to talk a little bit more to the people that have researched these and made them and sell them. My issue here is that the, um, we had a commercial um, glass top that I could use for canning. Um, and when I did do the canning, everything worked fine. But as you know, those glass tops hold heat for a long time. And one of the things about this whole process of preparing your foods is that is the heating up process, heating it up slowly so you don't suction the contents out of the jar and lowering the temperature slowly so you don't suction the contents out of your jar. But it's also a part of the whole processing time that the USDA declares what makes it safe. So it's bringing it up to the pressure, making sure you're using pressurized steam to process at the right temperature, and then processing for the right amount of time, and then the cooling down slowly is all part of keeping it safe. When it takes a long time for the burner to cool down, you don't want to move the pot off. The pressure may be gone, but the heat is still in there and things are still processing. And I have had like fresh field peas that just really turned to, I call it baby food because it turned to mush. And that changes the density of the product. And now I no longer know a safe temperature or a safe time, whether or not it processed to kill any possible botulism. So this is a key issue with this. And I don't know, you can still process 
Um, my question so far when I've put out that um, request has been, well, follow the manufacturer's recommendations. However, if something goes wrong, um, you don't know if you have a safe product. That product, you know, a lot of labor goes into it, especially if you've grown it and then even processing it. And it could, it could be a major loss. So I say use caution. Um, Judy has given us a picture of the electric burner that she uses at home. Be very careful with them. I tried propane once. It went through more than a, 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 um, a can. And then people also ask about doing them on their gas burners at home. Um, USDA doesn't recommend using like the outdoor um, burners that use uh, propane, but um, because of the fact that it's heat, um, it can be very high, it can cause problems to your equipment. The concern though that I have about that is please, why would you heat it up to the point where you would cause damage to your equipment? But be careful because I've also had electric burners that could not bring it up to pressure. Um, you might want to practice with those things a little bit. Like she said, when you get out your equipment at the beginning of the season, um, practice with your pot, get some water in it, see that um, steam's coming through okay, make sure it's not escaping around the rubber gaskets around the edges. <clears throat> Just make sure that your equipment's going to do what you need it to do. And once again, I'd say use caution when using um, the pots that are made for glass. Those, the pots that are not made for glass, one of the problems with the glass top stoves is that some of them are set up so that they will turn themselves off. If it starts to get too hot, they'll turn off and then they recycle. If you lose that heat, if you lose pressure, you have to start over again. And I can almost guarantee if you've had to start over again too many times, then you don't have a correct timing and it will impact the, the quality of your product and the consistency of it. So as of right now, they don't recommend using the glass top stoves, but um, it's really hard not to have a glass top stove. Um, these days it's very rare to get a coil element on a stove. And so um, if you have one, you might want to look into other alternatives to provide heat for your canner. Okay, um, we have about 15 minutes left and I want to say thank you very much to Judy for her time. She has been canning for years. I don't know if it's been quite a million like Haley suggested that she and I have been canning, but we've done quite a bit of canning between the two of us. And um, I, having her as a master food preserver has, has been a joy and um, she's got a lot of knowledge. And so we want to thank her for that. On our next slide, we have contact information for both Haley and I. And um, feel free to email us if you want to get in contact with Judy. We're going to protect her a little bit, so you can email one of us if you have a specific question for her. Um, and we'll make sure we get a, her the comments or questions to her through our emails. <clears throat> and then, um, before we get into questions and answering, we would like to have another poll if you would give us your input. We're about three quarters of the way there. Come on, everybody. There's no judgment. We're just trying to see what you've learned from our webinar today. We'll give it about 20 more seconds and I'm gonna close it out.
Also, as we go into the question and answers, I know we have some time today, but I wanted to let everybody know that we will have a question and answer session um, coming up and you will be required to register for it again. Um, so I will send that registration link along with the links to all the documents for today at the end of the webinar. And if we don't get to some of the questions, we can always um, either answer them the following day or if you don't get the answer at the next webinar, we can send out the answers via email to all the questions. There were two major questions that I really want to address and I want to, um, I appreciate Melanie, um, another FCS agent, um, Melanie Thomas for pointing out that um, we use the canner that you can use has to hold four quart jars. And why does it have to hold that? Remember when I was telling you at the end that that whole temperature of the process of coming up to pressure and then also cooling down is all part of that. If the pressure canner is not large enough, because just picture that you have a big pot on the stove and you have a small pot on the stove. The small pot on the stove is gonna heat up really fast, it's gonna cool down really quick, and then your big pot's gonna take a longer time to heat up and a longer time to cool down. That's what the critical timing is. Um, it's not the fact that it, you know, has to hold a certain amount as much as the timing and the research that's been done to make the timing effective. And then um, the blanching point came up. Um, we mentioned blanching and drying, but I'm not sure if we did it when freezing. And freezing is important if you blanch to stop that enzyme action that she was talking about, but the timing is important. So please refer back to the references. Um, for example, um, corn on the cob, depending on small ears, medium ears, or large ears of corn, it's different amounts. And one of the things the researchers told us is that if you're not going to do the right amount, it's better not to do it at all. Is it a required step to blanch? It is not a required step for safety. However, it does help maintain nutritional value, believe it or not. It does maintain quality and helps maintain color and um, with time may be able to keep it longer in the freezer. So seven years later, you find a package down in the bottom of your freezer. If it's been kept below zero degrees, it's fine and it's gonna be safe. It's just whether or not the quality is gonna be there. If it, you think it's gonna take you more than nine months to 12 months to eat the food that's in there, you think it might take you up to 18 months to eat it, um, I would recommend blanching. But once again, I don't know all exact science behind it, but um, you can imagine why blanching too long might be a problem. It'll break down the food, um, but not enough, then why bother and just um, freeze the product without blanching? Are there any other critical questions from the panel here that you really feel we need to answer right away? We've been keeping you sitting for a really long time. Um, question about different kinds of pectins. I think we, some of these kinds of things I'm going to have to look up for you and some more details. And so we can either email you, you have our email address if you're not able to come to question and answers time. But if you have other questions that you want to put into the chat or into the Q&A, we will do our best to um, prepare for those the Dropbox link, um, several of those are in there, uh, over in the chat box. So if you go over to the chat box, you should be able to see that there's a couple links in there. You may have to scroll up. And um, if you have a problem getting any of them, we can email you the links. Haley, I'm not sure if you're on here, if you can um, get the pros and cons sheet up there, or do we just want to email them to everybody? I'm here. I just stopped my video so that the screen was better. Um, I will email them to everybody. That way they aren't having to dig through the chat box. Okay. So look for an email from all of us. Um, when you registered, you provided your email. Um, so I'll make sure that I get that email out this afternoon. So they'll all be together on a single sheet and easy for you to get.
Okay, um, you're asking where you can get it after I get the recording. It is actually recording. Um, we have to um, get it uploaded and into a location which we don't have a link for yet, but um, we can send that out in an email as well where you can get the link to watch the recording. It'll also be a part of the Victory Garden, the 2020 Victory Gardens, which is one of the reasons that we decided to do this video. So if you want, you can also join in those modules and learn about not only the preservation, but also the harvesting, um, the food safety, and involve your kids in doing that as well. Um, so as we get it prepared for that, we should be able to share it um, with y'all as well. But that's another great resource that you can join to. Okay, Carol um, mentioned on here um, that there was uh, a client had called saying that she had a 74-year-old canner and old jars that she had inherited and was having problems, and it can be an issue. I'll be honest with you, I was given a super old canner that was very, very thick um, aluminum, and sometimes getting replacement parts for those is difficult. Um, I, I, don't think there's anything actually wrong with the actual pot itself. It might be some of the supplies that she needed to go with that. So starting over might be might be an issue. I'm seeing the prices are super high right now on a lot of canning things. And Judy, feel free to jump in here. Um, she said she's had problems with um, getting some things or finding some things. And the prices are going up because I think with the COVID, every, there's more interest in going back to that. That's, that's correct. Um, I sometimes at the very beginning of the season will buy maybe uh, nine or 10 dozen lids and the price may be $50. Well, now I have gone back and they're sitting at like $100. Um, but I went to my local uh, hardware store and they had the the good price so I got everything that they had and uh, I was only able to get seven boxes so uh, yes things are uh, it's hard to get things jars I've not had no pro hard had any problem but lids yes I've usually had to buy the rings and the lids and if you've done any canning you probably have uh, 32 dozen rings sitting around and you just need lids yep yeah, and so think about that expense, you know, when you go into it, um, it, it can be expensive to get started if you have to start off all fresh. So maybe find some friends and go in together, however that might work for you. We also had a question, how do I use the weight or the jiggler on the pressure canner? Um, that is very much after it is vented. Remember how the steam was coming out and then um, the, the weight was dropped on? That was a weighted gauge. The weighted gauges, or the, the jigglers, some people call them, um, they're fine. If you have the gauge canner with a gauge on it, you're gonna have a separate pipe that you'll drop a weight on. And so remember the differences between those two. The jiggler that you drop on, it'll rock. Some of your things, once again, that's why I say go back and, and put this on a pot um, before you start the season, see how it goes. If it's new to you, I bought a pressure canner once and it said that it should jiggle like so many seconds, um, so many times a minute. And that jiggler, it either jiggled or it didn't. And so get to know that. And so as long as it keeps rocking, you're good. If it starts rocking really fast, that's because it's also a regulator and it will keep your pressure at the right amount. So you're either at five pounds pressure, 10 pounds or 15 pounds, depending on which weight of the jiggler you use. So um, basically you just make sure that you have that right weight on there and then you want it to jiggle. When it starts to jiggle is when you start to time it. And then um, if it starts jiggling too fast, slowly turn it back down because you don't wanna lose all the steam out of your canner and have it go dry. And that's a risk when it jiggles too much. I have to put on these glasses, folks. These. <laughs> um, there are other questions here. 
and they're good questions. Um, we can going to have to look up about some of the different things about um, pectin. Um, having your test, the pressure gauges tested should be done once a year and um, contact your local extension office. There are some of us that do it. Otherwise, I think some manufacturers actually will check gauges as well. We were always told though, if you get a new gauge, it should be tested. Um, somebody asked about the Ninja food dehydrator option. I'm not um, familiar with it, but if it dries without cooking, if you can regulate the temperature and keep it low enough so that you're not cooking the fruit. What the problem is if the temperature is too high in a fruit or a vegetable, you're cooking the outside and this, the center stays moist. So you just want it really to dry out rather than cook. And so um, as long as it dehydrates and you can regulate the temperature, um, it, it, the equipment is fine. People who don't have a de, um, dehydrators actually can use a gas stove with a pilot on it. Um, not for meat, obviously, but for most of your vegetables. People like to do microwave herbs and those kinds of drying. Um, you can set things on fire very easily in the microwave. If you do it, it can be done. Just be careful. If you have a question that you really need answered right away that I've missed in some way, just um, put up your hand. We'll double check or if you have a question. Otherwise, I think that you've probably had enough sitting and it's time to go get your lunch. <laughs>